I am delighted to be able to introduce to you uh, Fred Colgan. He's going to tell us about InStove, the nonprofit he co-founded and is now the executive director of. I first heard about InStove, headquartered in, uh, I'm in, from his sister, who has been my good friend for more than 25 years. InStove, which is headquartered in Oregon, manufactures innovative cook stoves that are improving the lives of people most in need in refugee camps, schools, orphanages, hospitals, and clinics uh, in the developing world. Over 500 InStove stoves are now in service in 20 countries around the world, mostly in Africa. I believe you will be interested in what he has to say because of that impact and also because the stoves are so technologically innovative. Fred has been the driving force in establishing InStove's reputation around the world and he has traveled extensively in that effort. He's been in a dozen refugee camps and visited 11 countries in the last year and a half and is just back from Cambodia and will soon leave for South Sudan. Fred lived in and worked in the Bay Area for many years. Let's give him a warm welcome back. Test, am I good? <laughs> You're good. I don't need that. Oh, I'm wired. Ah, okay. Well, hello. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'd like you to introduce you to my wife, Lisa, who co-founded this organization with me. Um, about eight years ago, uh, Lisa and I met up with a, a brilliant engineer named Damon Ogle, who had been working on cook stove technologies. And Damon had just was nearing the completion of the design of a, of a stove very similar to this stove I have here today. Um, and we met and instantly formed a partnership, and we've been working together now for eight years to bring these stoves to the, to the world. And what Damon and I agreed on instantly was that we wanted to use our energy and our talents to bring good science, good technology to the poorest people on earth. The, in development circles they call it the bottom of the pyramid or the, the bottom billion, the, the poorest of the poor. And those people are in refugee camps, they're displaced people, they're the urban poor um, in the developing world. Places like Sub-Saharan Africa, there are more than 300 million people living on less than a dollar a day. In refugee camps, people are even poorer than that. About half of humanity today cooks on open fires. Um, and the, the dominant technology for cooking in the world is three rocks sitting on the ground with a pot perched on top of those rocks and a big fire underneath. We call that a three stone fire in the, in the stove world. But it is still the way most human beings cook their food every day. And the problems associated with that style of cooking are, are huge and manifold. They're harvesting way too much fuel wood to, to cook their food. Um, deforestation as a result of that. In some countries where I work, the deforestation rates are at 4% a year. Um, you don't have to be a mathematician to see what a catastrophe that is. Um, and then species loss follows that. All of these cook fires, a billion plus people a day lighting up cook fires, is a huge piece of global warming. Um, it's been recently discovered that uh, black carbon coming out of cooking fires is a huge factor in global warming. The black carbon lands on ice, it accelerates the melting of ice, um, and it's like 50 times more impactful than carbon dioxide in, in the global warming picture. Um, the lives of women um, are hard to describe. In most of the developing world, women do most of the work. 
Um, they do all of the cooking, they do all of the fuel gathering, um, and their lives are hugely shaped by increasingly diminished supplies of fuel wood. Um, I've been in camps where women have to walk out eight or ten kilometers to find wood, and then they walk back with it on their backs. They're walking through hostile territory. Um, um, it's, it, it is a horror story. Let me, st uh, let me show some images while I'm talking. I have to warn you, I can, do, I can talk all day long and into the night, so I'll try to self-edit. Um, so we're scientists and manufacturers and engineers, and our, our motivating force is people, is humanitarian relief to the people who are most desperate in the world. Today, right now, today, there are over 40 million people in refugee camps around the world. Most of the refugee, refugee camp residents are women and children. They have nothing. They've left everything behind. The UN is supporting these camps with minuscule budgets. Um, like every other entity around the world, um, budgets are shrinking while the needs get, get higher. When we, we just incorporated InStove last July, there were 35 million people in refugee camps, and today there are 40 million people in refugee camps. And these numbers are just skyrocketing. The problems are increasing. And the UN agencies we work with are now um, down to below 50% of the budgets they need to serve the populations they're serving. So we designed our stove specifically for this bottom of the pyramid niche and for institutions. So cooking technology is very complex. It's one of the oldest human activities. Um, and there are really two niches. There is institutional cooking where people are gathered, schools and refugee camps and orphanages where people are gathered in groups and being fed en masse. And that cooking is very simple. Typically, it's big pots of boiled food like rice and beans and what they call porridge in Africa is made from a variety of, of grains and, and vegetable. Um, very simple diets, very simple cookery. And most of these institutional cooks are cooking on these open fires, big pots of food. So us bringing new technology to the institutional setting that's very similar, really, to what they're using is a very simple process of introducing new technology. Household cooking is much, much more complicated. Um, it, at the household level, women need to make cook that tastes, need to cook food that tastes like the food their grandmothers made tastes like. Um, they've been cooking on open fires for, I don't know, 200,000 years, 300,000 years. Um, those are pretty deeply ingrained habits. And it's very hard to learn to use a brand new technology and produce the food that people are used to eating. And it's very important. It's so central to human life. Cooking is, is still very central. So the poorest of the poor cook on open fires. They may spend 40% of their energy collecting wood to cook, um, but it's very hard for them to change to something new. And it's very hard for us in the first world to bring appropriate stoves to people that they can afford. They have no money at a dollar a day. Your budget for cooking appliances is very low. And the problem is being addressed. There's a big global effort now to bring improved cook stoves to uh, a billion people right now. A billion stoves are needed around the world. Uh, there's a big global effort. There's a lot of energy. Um, um, Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation has been a big player in establishing some global organizations to address these problems. But our niche is very specific to, to institutions. And kids. I mean, this is about kids for us. It's about women and kids. So this is in Darfur, in a refugee camp. 
Um, we deal with two UN agencies primarily. One is called the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and they support the camps, and they keep the camps open. And the other is the UN World Food Program, and they, they bring food to people. The World Food Program feeds about 80 million people a day with basic foodstuffs. And their, their main program is school feeding programs. And what they've discovered is that a tiny boost of nutrition can radically change the lives of children by giving them enough protein for their brains to develop, by giving them enough, just a, just a little boost for, for basic health, they can change lives. And what I saw in Darfur, I could tell which kids were going to school and which kids weren't. Because the kids going to school were getting one serving a day of this high nutrition porridge that the World Food Program provides. And they were brighter eyed, their, their color was better, they were healthier, they were more vibrant. And the kids who didn't go to school were malnourished, paler, it really matters. And this is a, this is a ti tiny thing. It's a, you know, it's 15 cents worth of food that can transform lives. Um, the problem is cooking it. Getting this food there is not such a big problem, but cooking it is a big problem. It's, it's what we're trying to address. So we wanted to make stoves that were portable and affordable and safe. Um, at the end of this week, I'm going to Palm Springs to address the um, annual convention of uh, American burn surgeons. A lot of them go to Africa and do their pro bono work and treat burn victims, almost all of whom are burned from, from cooking. Cook fires, women's clothes get slit on fire, kids fall into the fire, pots of food get tipped over on people, and the American burn surgeons have decided, gee, we could be proactive in preventative um, programs and bring safe stoves to people and make a difference that way. So we're very excited to be partnering with hopefully uh, uh, 500 uh, burn surgeons uh, later this week. This is what a typical um, institutional cooking situation looks like. This is in Dolorado Camp in, in um, Ethiopia, it's right on the Somali border. When I was here, there were about 2,000 people a day coming in to the camp. And they were mostly malnourished women with uh, a bunch of kids. Um, they had about 25 of these open fires going all day long. This pall of smoke looked like a forest fire. Um, and they were bringing in a big 18-wheeler uh, of wood every day to support this camp. Um, so, so these pots are roughly equivalent in size to the pot in our stove there. And what they would use would be this ma mountain of wood. What we've accomplished with this stove is, is to make a super efficient stove. So that pot of food there, we can bring to a boil and cook the pot of food for a couple of hours on about this much wood. This is about two kilos of wood. Um, and that's about... 90% improvement in fuel economy over, a, over an open fire. Um, later on, I think maybe towards the end of lunch, those of you who with an engineering uh, interest, we can bring the stove outside and I'll light it up for you and show you how it works. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting for us uh, to show it off. It's not for everyone though. I think some of you will probably want to go home. So um, we'll offer that up later. This is a kitchen I was recently in in Senegal, and these women were cooking uh, 11 or 12 hours a day in this kitchen, and it was uh, smaller than this room, and you could not see across the room. Um, smoke inhalation, we're discovering, is a huge disease problem throughout the developing world. Uh, they're estimating now that 5 million people a year die from the direct results of smoke inhalation. Millions more uh, are weakened by it and die of other diseases. The, the equivalent, so working in a room like this would be the equivalent of smoking five or six packs of cigarettes in a day. And women and their kids are in these, in these environments 
uh, cooking for others. And it's a problem that needs addressing. One of our design considerations and one of our accomplishments with this stove is to eliminate smoke. So we've reduced smoke by 90%. We have a chimney stove, so what little smoke there is goes up above where the cooks are or vents out of the building if they're inside. Um, and we've eliminated the uh, inhalation of smoke by institutional, institutional cooks who have it the worst. Um, this is a, a public celebration in Senegal. They have these uh, often in that country where um, hundreds of thousands of people come and all are fed. It's Senegalese culture is fascinating. They are, um, they are um, Sufi Muslims, very mystical. It's an amazing culture. But when they have these celebrations, all are fed. So they, they will line the streets with, with cook fires. In one of them, we're going back in December to what's called the Magal Tuba, where 1.5 million people come for dinner in this small town. And there, there are streets after street after street lined with these cook fires. They're burning mountains of firewood. The smoke is so thick you, can, you, I, you have to get upwind of it to get a breath of air. Um, and it's another place where we're looking forward to some great partnerships. Uh, and this is about technology, but this is about humanitarian service and the lives of women I I'm not going to dwell on it because the stories are so horrific but we can change the lives of women um, who spend now in many places 40% of of women's inner energy in a day is dedicated to gathering fuel to cook on um, so So this is our vision. Um, these stoves are clean, safe, um, easy to operate, and the women love to cook on them. And that's the bottom line is if the cooks aren't happy, the stove is going to be a failure. And I, I have many friends and colleagues who have brought what looked like brilliant stove designs to the developing world, and the women had not been consulted up front and they became flower pots and uh, other object art around the house. Um, the cooks have got to be involved in the design process and, and the stove has to be made so the cooks will really enjoy using it to cook on. This, this is my first uh, pilot project. This is in um, Niger State in uh, northern Nigeria. We brought three stoves to a school there with 1,250 students and we install the stoves and they began cooking and they cook all the food for those 1200 girls on these three stoves we've been back now twice uh, after three years they use all these stoves all day long and they do all the cooking and they're saving over 90 percent of fuel so they paid for these stoves these were donated by another agency but they would have paid for themselves in six or seven months in save fuel costs so um, so this, this was our great first success and uh, the 1st of June we're going back to Nigeria where we're going to start building stoves in country. So we have a method we call Stove Factory in a Box where we can build these stoves anywhere in the world. So our Nigerian partners now have received two containers of tools and parts. Um, we're going to go over and train eight uh, production workers to start building stoves in that country. They've already sold 2,000 stoves to schools. They expect to sell 10,000 more to schools alone in Nigeria. And we're looking to support a huge business over there. Um, my personal goal, I would love to see tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these stoves built before I die. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to see a million before I leave this uh, mortal coil. So. This is my favorite quote. Now, this is on, on my second trip back to Nigeria. The cook said, with the new stoves, it doesn't hurt to breathe. My eyes don't burn. My back doesn't hurt from bending over the fire, and my baby has quit crying. 
So how are we going to do this? How are we going to get tens of thousands of stoves? What we call stove factory in a box is our method where we bring the tools and the parts to the developing world, teach people how to build them, and then continue to supply the technology to keep them in production, to keep these stoves coming off the line there, close to the end user. So these stoves will last maybe 10 or 12 years if someone is able to service them, replace parts when they wear out. Um, and that's our dream, is to have these regional players um, building and delivering and then servicing and maintaining these stoves. Um, we'd like to see them all with warranty programs so that the stoves are guaranteed. Ah, uh, technology. Uh, um. right. So what would be the raw material? I mean, to, to just okay, what, make it yeah, to go. what we've done with this, this stove is a, is a, our whole methodology is a marriage of 21st century high-tech American material science and laser cut parts and what would look like a 19th century production shop. So most of the tools are hand tools, hand brakes, uh, like a metal working shop from 1900 would not look a whole lot different from our shop today. So yeah, so and then we've made about uh, eight uh, custom jigs that force precision construction. So p part of what we've learned over the years in working with stoves is that it precision construction really matters. So in this stove, if we, we built a one millimeter tolerance, that's very close, and a, and a mistake of, of a couple of millimeters can affect performance by 20%. It can be huge. So they have to be precisely made. So we've made this method that, that starts with high tech materials and then goes to mostly what we would call semi-skilled tasks to do the assembly. Um, and then it's all guided by these specialty tools that we make that look even clunkier. If we can get the show back up, I'll show you what some of our tools look like. So we're, so we're making it impossible to, to mess up the stove. You, have, you can only make it one way, and that's to this precision uh, construction. Hooray. Okay. We're back in business. Yeah. <coughs> We're starting the list around. You might be starting the sign-in list around. So. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, we're circulating a sign-up list. If you're interested in staying in touch with us, we're glad to put you on our mailing list. We will send you newsletters um, and keep in touch. Um, so this is a spontaneous add-on. The cooks in Nigeria put this big frying pan on top and started frying away. We were actually recommending against it, but it works perfectly well. It's slightly less fuel efficient uh, than, than the, the sunken pot, but it works just fine. And in Senegal, they have these really clever rice cookers. So they make the national dish as a big pot of stew, and they put a rice cooker on top of the pot to steam the rice with flavored steam coming up from the, from the stew. And it just so happened that their indigenous rice cooker just fits perfectly on our stove and with that much space to clear behind the, behind the chimney and, uh, and works really well with the Senegalese food is the most complex I've seen anywhere. Um, oh, so we're back to this, okay. So secondary technologies. Um, when we started, we thought we're gonna do, we're gonna do big cook stoves and that's gonna be it. Um, immediately, people started complaining that this stove was not big enough. So we've now developed a 100 liter version of this stove. It's almost twice as big. And we're in production on that stove now. And the demand for it, I think, is greater than for the 60 liter stove. Many of these places, they're feeding thousands of people a day. And so a 100 liter pot, and, which is, and the 100 liter stove is faster than what we have, so um, much more attractive to, to institutions. Um, we're delivering our, our first 100 liter stoves over the next few months. Um, so we've developed an autoclave application, and this is a bad day to have something that looks like a pressure cooker, but um, the autoclave is for sterilizing medical instruments. Okay? We've been in 
clinics, particularly in the camps, where they have no method to sterilize instruments. We saw one where they were setting the um, surgical instruments out in the sun between patients and hoping for the best. And the guidebooks say, you know, if you get hurt in Africa, don't go to the hospital, go to the airport. And it's absolutely true, the disease vector is, is a nightmare in, in hospitals and clinics. Even in urban areas, the power's out four or five hours a day. They have no way to sterilize instruments without power. So what, we've, what we have here is a backup system or a primary system for rural clinics. We, we decided we wanted to pair an autoclave with our stove and, and looked around and found this particular unit in a catalog. It looked like a good fit. And we ordered our first one, thinking we would have to make some, do some engineering to make an adapter to make it fit our stove. And we took it out of the box and put it in the stove. And it's a perfect fit. So we were done. It actually fits the stove better than our own pot. So it was like some kind of intervention at work. Um, so this application, we're in four countries now with autoclave stove combinations, and the, the demand for that's going to be huge. We're doing a pilot project in Nepal later this year, um, sterilizing medical waste, which is another huge disease vector in the developing world, where the nasty stuff that comes out of the hospital just goes into the waste stream, and it's toxic, it's dangerous. There's a huge HIV AIDS epidemic. There's all kinds of reasons to clean that stuff up and possibly autoclaving it um, is, a good, is a good fit and a good fix. Um, we can run a sterilization cycle in that autoclave with about 800 grams of fuel. That's about this much fuel would run a cycle on that. Um, so, Autoclaves. Oh, I have an autoclave picture. There we go. Um, but I have the autoclave here. Um, this is a briquette press. We're working on a method of alternative fuel. So in many of the places we work, the fuel is gone. The fuel wood is gone. In Darfur, in some of the camps in, in Kenya, close to where the big populations of Somali refugees are. They've been there so long, they've picked, completely picked the wood supplies over. There's, there's literally none left. In much of, much of Haiti, there's no fuel wood left. So we're developing an alternative fuel method called briquettes. It's not new technology, but what we're doing is hard to see. They're, kind of, they're stick-shaped briquettes. So we can make fuel out of anything that is cellulose-based. So you can make fuel out of uh, straw or crop waste or peanut shells or rice hulls or waste paper or donkey dung. Anything that's cellulose based can, can make really good fuel. So we press out these sticks. The, a briquette now are, looks about like this. And it replaces wood gram for gram as fuel. Our stoves get very hot. We get a very, very high temperature in the stove around 1100 degrees C, which is almost 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So at those temperatures, our combustion, that's part of the why we get efficient and clean is because we're burning so hot, we're burning up the smoke, and we're getting total combustion. So briquettes work really well in our stoves, and we've done some experimenting replacing wood 100% with briquettes, and it's doable. So we're very excited. We're bringing our first briquette presses to the world this year. We'll do some field trials, and uh, uh, we know this has a lot of legs that, that people really see it as a, as a viable alternative. Um, and particularly these women who are out gathering wood, we see the briquette press as a small business. So we're hoping to deliver this for a couple hundred dollars. And then women, instead of going out and gathering firewood, could make their own fuel and maybe make some excess and sell it to their neighbors, maybe enlist some of the kids to gather materials. There are all kinds of small business dreams that we have. And this is big in the whole international development community. Uh, aid now, the, the focus of aid is development. It's, it's looking to solve root problems, not just bring what's immediately needed, but bring some methodologies to change the 
fundamental equation, to change lives, to give people some economic opportunity. And poor women in the developing world, the, the window of opportunity is very tiny. There are very, very few things they can do to generate income. Right now, wood gathering is the primary economic activity of poor women, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a very, very hard way to make, a, to make it. So we're hoping this will take off. We're hoping to find support for the, for the briquetting. And we're uh, going to field trials in Zambia in a couple of months with a water pasteurization system. And this fits in our stove. Um, um, about half of child mortality in the world is caused by waterborne diseases. And you know, there's a whole host of critters that live in water, um, from polio to uh, hepatitis. Um, that can be all can be killed by pasteurization. Um, you know, when the when the power goes out or the water gets bad in an emergency, the the Red Cross will tell us to boil our water for five minutes or something. That's about a hundred times overkill. You don't have to do that. And part of the reason people drink dirty water in the developing world is they can't afford the fuel to clean it up. So they absolutely could not afford to boil water for five minutes, but you don't have to. Pasteurization is uh, to bring water up to about 165 degrees for 15 seconds. will kill all the critters that harm human health. So we've developed a system that is very, very fuel eco economical that delivers about 100 gallons an hour out of one of our stoves. So we're seeing, again, another opening for a what could potentially be a small business. Maybe we find some donor agencies to fund bringing the water pasteurizer system to a village. Some people are, are set up as a, as a business to provide clean water to their neighbors for very low costs. Um, we think that has huge, huge legs and huge possibility to, I mean, to save, we're talking millions of lives, right? And it's, it's a matter of resource allocation. People don't clean up their water because they can't afford to. Um, we're trying to make it affordable. So this, um, this is our newest staff member. This young engineer is um, powering up a pump that's run by a bicycle. So to get the water up to the tower then and, and gravity feed in the water pasteurizer, we have this very clever um, bicycle-powered pump that another colleague of ours is making out of old um, pool filters. He, when pool filters fail, the, the motor fails, and they throw away the pump unit. So he's getting them for nothing and making these developing world uh, pumps. And this delivers a huge capacity. It's like uh, uh, 50 gallons a minute of water if you have someone young enough and strong enough to keep to keep pumping so uh, and then this could be used for irrigation when they're not doing the pasteurization cycle um, and the pasteurizer is a it's built around a heat exchanger and some fail-safe valves so that water will not pass through if it hasn't been at these minimum temperatures for a minimum amount of time. So we're, it's fail safe. We're getting 100% kill of the harmful organisms. And as we fine tune it, we're getting our capacity up. So right now, we're, we're, our target is 1,000 gallons a day per unit. And we think that's uh, easily doable. So we'll be in Zambia in July with our first uh, field applications of this. And this. This fellow here is my partner, my co-founding uh, engineer. His name is Damon Ogle. And um, he's all engineer. I do all the talking. He does all the engineering. Uh, we're, a good, we're a good team with the support of our wives. Uh, so a little bit of history. We started 2005. We started the stove design. Damon built the first stoves actually in the field in Uganda. They didn't work as well as we thought. He brought the thing home, and we started then building this process 
of building the stoves, which was to get the quality built in, to get the methodology down so that we could build these stoves anywhere in the world. Um, 2010, we've had our first pilot projects. That's when I went to Nigeria with the stoves. Um, 2011, we sold stoves to the UN, the World Food Program. We took 200 stoves to Darfur. Those stoves are all in service today, feeding about 80,000 kids a day. Um, we're in Ethiopia in every refugee camp in Ethiopia. Um, we're now in 20 countries around the world. Um, and last July, we incorporated as InStove, as our own standalone um, not-for-profit organization. We evolved as a part of a, another nonprofit in Oregon called Aprovecho Research Center. And they are the, they're the world leaders in stove technology development. Um, but their, th their main thrust is testing equipment. And um, as a testing lab, there's a natural um, tension between testing and, and manufacturing. So we knew from the beginning we were, going to, we were going to have to have separate organizations. So as of July 1st, InStove is, uh, is separate on its own. We are an uh, Oregon nonprofit. We're waiting for our uh, status from the IRS, our 501c3 nonprofit status. Any day now, they tell us. But, you know, the federal government's working pretty slow these days. Uh, uh, so we don't know. Um, our first factory in Nigeria, um, June 1 is our target date. I just got a photo yesterday. The, the factory walls are up. They're putting a roof on it next week. Um, our containers are there with the stoves and tools. And my guys are ready. They've already hired the team. So I'm imagining June 1st, we start producing stoves in Nigeria. Um, and then I'm going uh, to South Sudan uh, next week. Um, we just sent 50 more stoves to the World Food Program for refugee camps there. And South Sudan, I don't know if you follow that news. Um, you know, we don't get very good news here. And it's, very, you know, there's only one international crisis per issue, per, you know, per week or per month. I, there seems to be a quota. South Sudan is a catastrophe. It just continues to be awful. Um, people are pouring across the border. There's all this tension over oil. The Sudanese government are awful criminals. Um, Darfur is bad enough. South Sudan is, is equally bad. And it's a brand new crisis. So they don't, the UN doesn't have the infrastructure built to really serve these people. So I'm happy and proud to be going there to I'll be training cooks and training trainers and installing some stoves and then doing some field studies. What we want to do is, is teach others to do the measuring in the field to prove the efficacy of these stoves. And that's the way we build the demand for them and, and the, um, the desire on the part of the agencies, the administrators, the funders to, to put these stoves in service. So we, uh, we mass produce in Oregon. We've made 500 stoves to date. We're um, projecting 1,000 stoves manufactured in the next year out of our Oregon facilities. And that's a geometric progression. We're looking at the demand, looking at the way the orders are coming in. And we expect in the next three or four years to just keep doubling and redoubling and redoubling that. And then um, the um, factory in a box partners we think will be thousands of stoves. Uh, by the end of this year, we expect to be shipping several containers a month of parts, and those numbers should be going up very, very fast. Oh, there we go. Well, I just said all that. So here's one of our custom jigs. So these really are 19th century looking tools. Um, this is the way to force precision. It's the way to reduce this, this really precise production method into something that we can teach easily, um, that can be learned and retained quickly. So this, it just takes, it just, it, 
I got my first big order for 200 stoves from the UN and went out in our little town and hired eight guys who had never worked in metal shops. And in less than a month, we were at full production. So it's, it's that quick to teach. The uptake is that quick. Um, I was in construction all my life. My partner was, uh, I ran a, an, engineer, an engineering business where he was hands-on and we both um, um, know how to get things done and how to teach people how to get things done. So we're really proud of this system. It's reality based. What there's a lot of there's appropriate technology and there's not appropriate technology. Much of what we export is completely inappropriate. Anything high tech for the developing world other than phones is not appropriate. Um, most of the stove designs that have gone out there are not appropriate. They're not they're just not able to withstand the use and they're not able to to serve the needs of people um, um, but um, we think we're there a lot of these operations are hand operations we've tried to cut power requirements okay most of the places we're working the power is very spotty so our first little factory is going to be in a town called uh, Afikpo in Nigeria which was the heart of um, Biafra Remember Biafra? <laughs> uh, a long time ago. Um, anyway, it's very rural. There's not much around. Um, why am I telling you this story? I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost that thread. Um, power. The power's off about most of the time. The power's off in Afikpo. So, so much of this, you can produce these stoves with two power tools and the rest is done with hammers and hand, hand rollers and hand benders and brakes and um, the basic construction of the complicated parts is sort of looks like origami in, in steel. So there's all this fancy bending of these really wacky looking parts into boxes and cylinders and then they all get spun together and joined and pressed. And, um, it's, it's pretty fun and pretty simple step at a time and the end result is a is a stove with interchangeable parts um, that can be made so we're taking we have generators in Nigeria we'll have uh, we have two generators a, a, a backup and a backup of the backup so that if the power is out we can keep going but with a drill and a small spot welder we can build these stoves um, so that was part of our design too to make it not dependent on on the grid um, A lot of hammering. It's very noisy work. Um, what we're doing with our Oregon production is we're upgrading the, a lot of the tools. We're going to make it more efficient. We can't afford to pay American workers to swing hammers. But these are great jobs in sub-Saharan Africa where prevailing wages are a couple of dollars a day. Um, if people can find jobs, it's it. In Nigeria, they, they have one of the highest um, graduation rates in Africa and about 60% unemployment. So there are no jobs for their graduates. So this is really thrilling to be able to, to create some employment opportunities there. Um, and this is the, us scaling up. So these are parts that we've shipped to Nigeria. Um, we can get about 240 stove kits on one container of stoves. That's every part necessary to build the stoves. Um, so we're anticipating, again, multiple containers going out every week to support these, these factories around the world. Um, so we're all over. We're in 20 countries as of today. Uh, this last week we shipped to uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the first time. We have stoves en route to um, to, Zim to Z Zambia. Uh, um, and the stoves are arriving this week in uh, South Sudan, where I'm going to be going to, to install. So we're partnered with a bunch of interesting um, international organizations. Um, USAID has funded our uh, Nigeria factory. Um, we're partnered with GIZ, which is the German Foreign Development Corporation. They act sort of like GIZ. Actually, they're, 
a little more honest than GIZ with no, no propaganda wing. Uh, they just do development work. Um, and they are, we're partnering with them in five countries. Um, we have stoves out with about 40 little NGOs. A lot of faith-based groups have bought single stoves to ship to their orphanage project or the school they're supporting around the world. And it's all kind of congealing. And now um, um, some, of the, some of the small church organizations have convinced their parent church organizations to look at creating partnerships with us. So we're very optimistic that this is our, this is our moment, this is our, this is our year to create the, the web of collaborative um, um, opportunities to take this to the next level and the level beyond that. We've, uh, we've self-funded to date. Um, my wife and I and my partner Damon and his wife um, and one board member put up a loan, but we've self-funded to date. Now we're at this point of needing to find funding. So I'm not going to do a heavy pitch on you guys. Uh, we need money, um, that's that, and that's going to be true for years. Um, but more importantly, we need to we need to close the three degrees of separation between ourselves and other people who might be interested in supporting this work. So whether it's a group that's supporting an orphanage somewhere or the Packard Foundation, um, somehow I'm hoping you all can help us get in touch with people who can help us move forward and, and bring this work ahead. Um, we need money, we need, I need, someone someday is gonna say, I know Oprah Winfrey and I'll, <laughs> and I'll call her up for you. I mean, that, we're ready, <laughs> I'm ready for Oprah. And someone, but someone has to know who to call, right? Um, that kind of thing is something you all can help us with greatly. And we expect miracles and we continue to see miracles almost daily with this. People, people come, People want to be involved with this. We have a fabulous board of directors. Um, we have uh, interns from the university, um, more than we can handle. Um, we have volunteers and uh, fabulous staff of young people um, looking to build this organization into sustainability and bring these stoves in, in big numbers to the people who need them the most. So uh, these are kids in Darfur, and this is what keeps me going: is being able to being able to bring something to these kids that's going to change their lives. And I never thought I was going to go to Africa. I never dreamed of it. I never wanted to. And this whole thing came to me in a way I can't describe. It just it was meant to be. This is what I was supposed to do with my retirement. Um, we bought a place in Oregon by the river. I was going to sit by the river and read my books for the rest of my life. And <laughs> instead, I got this amazing opportunity. And uh, uh, I'm so blessed to get to do this. Um, and I hope you all can, can help us in whatever way you can to move it forward. So um, I think after lunch or towards the end of lunch, I'd be happy to roll this stove outside and light it if you're interested in seeing how it works, okay? For those of you, it's not for everybody, but I think there are probably some engineering wonks here who would like to see that. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi. So I, we have a mic I'll bring around for those uh, with questions. I see one hand up. Anyone to anyone else? So I catch everybody. Okay. Uh, some years ago on the TV, there was uh, a feature about uh, child's merry-go-round operated uh, water pump, <laughs> and uh, I don't. I know this isn't your particular line, but. Uh, 
uh, after seeing that, and then a few months later, they said, "Oh, the children aren't uh, jumping on this thing anymore. They, they're, they're not uh, not u using it, so the water doesn't come out." Uh huh. Uh, do you have any comments about that? Well, it really it's about appropriate appropriateness of technology, and and for technology to be appropriate, it has to be it has to solve a problem. It has to be easy for people to uptake. It has to be something that's simple enough to where people can, can incorporate it into their lives. And so we bring a lot of wacky ideas to poor people. You know, um, um, there's still a huge amount of energy in America to bring solar cooking to poor people, right? Well, this is the answer for you all. Just learn how to do solar cooking. Well, how many of you all cook on solar cookers in your backyard in the middle of the day, you know? It's, it sounds good, it makes good sense, but we're asking people to change their lives and to change the way they cook for their families. And frankly, it hasn't happened and it probably isn't gonna happen because it's not appropriate. So, um, it's a, there's a fine line there to find that what's appropriate, what isn't. We build everything tough enough so it can fall off the back of a truck and still and pick it up and dust it off and still use it. So durability is important. Um, and appropriateness is a very fuzzy concept, but yeah, I, that's, that's my answer, yeah. Okay. Hi, Fred. Uh, my name is Brandy, and I wanted to say thank you very much for such a good presentation. It was really interesting. Thank and you. I, speaking for everyone, I think it was really fascinating. Um, I had two questions for you. I wanted to know, first of all, how much do you, the cook stoves cost? Um, my second question is more of a cultural consideration. Um, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon um, as an agroforestry volunteer. And I guess my comment would be that everyone um, in northern Cameroon at least, um, cooked sitting, bending over the fire as you mentioned. And bringing in new technologies, the five people in the village where I was who had propane, two burner propane stoves, um, they would place those on the floor, not use those in I guess an American or Western manner of having it on an upright surface. And so I wondered if you've come across any issues with having the women standing as opposed to sitting, and if that is new to them or if they don't like standing, um, I could see that being an issue. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, interesting questions. Um, mm -hmm. um, we have stoves in Cameroon, and actually I just met some more people from Cameroon. We're, we're building a, a coalition there. Um, as far as standing up, so Again, we're in this one niche of institutional cooking where they put these big pots on three stones and they do bend over all day and they're used to that. The one quote I had from the cook where she said, my back doesn't hurt. Once they get, they, get, they kind of in the body memory realize the ergonomics of standing up straight and working at a stove at this level are much different after 11 hours than bending over a fire like this, they go, wow, this is really cool, this really works. I've had no complaints once they've used the stoves for that, for that change in ergonomics. Um, in, in household stoves, they cook on the ground. A lot of that's because the pots tip over and scald the kids and that's so frequent and the the lower the pot is, the safer it is for the kids. And it's habit, you know, uh, people, people have these kind of ways of doing things, particularly what I've seen in Africa, um, a lot of what's done you d is done kind of squatting on your heels. So I've seen people building stoves that way. And uh, um, we, think there are, we think there are behavior changes that, are, that can be made. That are that are appropriate, that are culturally sensitive, and there are behavior changes that are not going to happen. So it's we try to be really re realistic and reality based. One of the complaints about our stoves is that it only accepts small wood. So in many places they're they're cooking on big chunks of wood like this. And they say, well, the cooks will never split up the wood and make small wood. And that we've been very stubborn with that, saying they have to. They're going to save so much wood, they can hire somebody to split the wood. And the, if there's one behavior change we want to see, it's going to, moving to small wood, which is sustainable, 
So small sticks you can, you can harvest without tearing, cutting down the whole tree. So that kind of behavior change we, we embrace. But we try very hard to be really sensitive culturally to, to the way people do things. Um, and that said, we're in this niche of institutions where we have, it's much, much simpler than, than at the household level. Yeah. Yeah. Did I get there with your question? Okay. Very good. Thank yeah. you. I would, oh, here. Okay, hi. I would like to say I completely agree with you to serve the poorest of the poor first. So I really admired the focus that you two are putting in. On the wood or fuel supply, I've seen that many times it's a big problem, enormous waste of energy. And I like your idea of the briquettes. I personally am also interested in wood pellets because similar thing, but you can combine it. I wonder what would you think about growing your own wood, either by harvesting sagebrush or whatever is indigenous there, or growing your own like bamboo. Some species, I understand, can grow one foot in one day. Right. That could be a separate industry. You could make the jigs and fixtures to chop it up into small little wood pellets and, and, and employ people and sell it to the people using your stove. Uh, uh. The second question I would like to say is Harvard School of Engineering has a program, I think it's called Let There Be Light, where you present to them, the engineering students, a problem they come up with the solution. Hmm. And one of those was the f foot powered irrigation pump hmm. that the other gentleman mentioned. Instead of a bicycle, it was a pump. Right. And here's the method that I like, and I'd like to uh, discuss it with you. To achieve economy of scale, what they would do is go to one manufacturing, the next biggest town or whatever, and say, we would like to give you exclusive rights to build our stoves. You give them the jigs, the fixtures, the in-house knowledge, you know, everything that you do there and said, okay, you've got it exclusively. And with economies of scale, they're gonna get better like everybody else. Right. You say, two things we're gonna, we're gonna require. One, it's a fixed price. You will not raise the price when you see that the demand gets better, whatever, that's one. Second that you need to agree to is you will provide the financing for this. These are poor indigenous people. We would like for you to allow them to pay four equal payments per year with no interest. If you agree to that, we will give you exclusive rights plus all the technical details that you have mm -hmm. that's in there, sort of like a franchise. Right. And that way you can achieve the same thing without shipping all the stuff there they could use and convert maybe indigenous machines or leftover things that it's there. Uh, so I'd appreciate your comments. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first on the fuel, um, we have a lot of colleagues. So the stove world is fairly small. There are not a lot of people working on these issues. Um, this is technology for poor women. Uh, guess what? It's not a great profit opportunity. And there's been very little corporate interest in working on these technologies. Very little university efforts gone into this technology. So this is, most of what's happened has come from really garage mechanics working away at the problem. And we have what we call stove camp up in Oregon twice a year where people come from around the world and we, we get together and everyone shows off their latest inventions. We, we work collaboratively to bring, to bring stove designs forward. So uh, pellet fuel, um, there's a new stove design out called a TLUD, T-L-U-D, which is a, a basically a pellet cooking stove um, using prepared fuel. Um, it's still probably a decade away from being uh, ready for for women cooks in the th in the third world because it's a it's a complete change in the method of cooking. So pellet stoves are um, batch loaded. And, and TLUD stands for top lit updraft. When you cook with pellets, you're burning from the top down. Um, and so you have to preload the stove. And then it's very hard to adjust the temperature. Okay? It's one, it's, 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 it's high all the time. And so that's a, a problem yet to be overcome, the, t the technology side of that. And then delivering the fuel pellets is another, another series of problems to make the fuel pellets and then distribute them to cooks. Um, 
and people are working on it, but, but they're, big, they're big supply chain problems. Um, LPG is a, is a clean fuel, but the, the cost and the delivery systems are very, very difficult to overcome. I have colleagues who are, doing, who are growing fuel wood and looking at ways to create, to create fuel supplies that are sustainable and non-impactful on the natural environment. With these stoves, small wood, fast-growing wood, could grow twigs very fast to support these stoves. And that's why, we, that's why we designed it for small wood, because we believe that is sustainable. Um, there's a lot of energy around the world on solving these problems. And, and these, are, these are global scale problems. Um, the emissions from cook stoves um, get very close to tailpipe emissions from vehicles as far as global warming impacts. It's, it's a huge issue. And the gains can be very fast. So one of these stoves will offset uh, 30 to 40 tons of CO2 a year. So that's the equivalent of the average American family footprint. Um, and we sell these stoves for $650. You know, someone asked the price. Um, that's cost. We sell at cost. Um, 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 the co collaborative. Collaborative uh, ventures and and the uh, collaborative organizations we put together, we have I have about eight different models in the balls in the air right now for ways to bring production to other countries, and they're um, they're as varied as the countries are, but what we are able to deliver is the technology and the and the methodology to build the best stoves in the world. What we rely on our partners to do is everything else, to come up with the funding, to figure out the distribution methodology, to figure out what part of the production can be done with, with domestic resources, what we have to continue to import, um, um, how, the marketing plans, the business plans, all of those things we have to rely on others to do. So that's why the, connecting with these larger agencies like GIZ and uh, um, USAID, we're able to, to get some base funding then for collaborative ventures to get off the ground. Um, and we're working, I think our next factory series is probably going to be Senegal where we have some uh, public partner, public-private partnership evolving uh, with the Senegalese government and uh, some religious societies and GIZ. And that, we don't know yet what that's going to look like. Um, pricing's an interesting issue. We really don't have a lot of control over what these get sold for. We are encouraging our partners to keep the price low. We're going to continue to to keep their feet to the fire by selling them at cost. It's very hard to compete with a nonprofit that's selling goods at cost. So, um, and that's part of our philosophy, is that we want to get as many stoves out there as we can at the lowest possible price. If we start to make any more money, we're going to drop our prices. That's our, that's our goal beyond sustainability, is to drive these prices down with economies of scale, with overseas production, with subsidization. You know, this, I mean, small change for Gates Foundation. We could subsidize our, we could subsidize our stoves and sell them even cheaper. I'm supposed to stop? <laughs> so I'm here. I'd be happy to keep talking to you individually uh, through lunch. Um, sometimes at 3 a.m. my wife will say, stop talking about stoves. Uh, <laughs> but I can't help myself. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the great questions. And, yeah.